This is an IB biology video suitable for candidates sitting higher level IB and it's on the photosynthesis topic. We're going to be looking at firstly the structure of the chloroplast and how it's adapted to carry out photosynthesis and then we're going to be looking at the light dependent and light independent stages of photosynthesis. So we're looking at very complex biochemistry indeed because remember that includes the Calvin cycle. And then finally, I'm going to finish off by looking at some past exam questions. So this is going to be a very in-depth video indeed, and hopefully by the end of it, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with what is considered widely to be one of the most difficult A-level topics. The first step is obviously to think about what is the point of photosynthesis, and where is it carried out, and what carries it out. So photosynthesis is carried out by plants. Some photosynthetic bacteria also carry out photosynthesis, but we're going to be looking at photosynthesis in plants, so your bog standard photosynthesis. The whole point of it, remember, is to make organic compounds. And really, what we're talking about here is glucose. This is the method by which plants make their food. So remember, photo means relating to light, synthesis means making, so we're making food using light energy from the sun. Just to look at our summary equation, we're reacting water with carbon dioxide in the presence of light to produce glucose, and then oxygen is a byproduct of this reaction. Our balanced symbol equation is as follows glucose is a hexose sugar, it's made up of six carbons. Just balance it by using sixes. And now we're ready to really start looking in depth at photosynthesis and making this an A level video as opposed to a GCSE video. So here's a generic plant cell. Remember, it has a cell wall made of cellulose, plasma membrane, a permanent vacuole, and a nucleus. Crucially, it has green structures known as chloroplasts, and these are the site of photosynthesis. And if we take a closer look at those chloroplasts, we can see that they're quite complex organelles. I'm going to talk through their structure and explain how their structure is related to their function. So first of all, the chloroplast is green, and that's due to the presence of chlorophyll. Now, very importantly, with photosynthesis, we need to zoom in on the thylakoid, which we can see is here. Now, thylakoids are small sacs which have a membrane surrounding a lumen, and we can see them here. And a stack of thylakoids is known as a granum. And you can think of the thylakoids as being individual coins, which a stack of coins would therefore be the granum. So we're going to start by making notes on thylakoids. So let's start by describing how the thylakoid membranes are adapted. So they provide a large surface area. And because the thylakoids are sac-like in shape, it means that they have an inside space. And that's needed for the accumulation of protons. And I promise I'll explain why that's important later. We'll just add a note here that's saying that granum is a stack of thylakoid membranes. Next up, we'll zoom in on the stroma. Now, the stroma is simply a space which contains the enzymes needed for the Calvin cycle, and one of those very important enzymes is Rubisco. Again, we'll talk about why that's important later. The starch grain is simply a carbohydrate store. The outer and inner membranes are important because they contain the all-important photosystems. Now we're ready to look at the biochemistry of photosynthesis. So the first thing you need to know is that photosynthesis is split into two stages. Now the first stage of photosynthesis is the light-dependent stage, and as the name suggests, it relies on light. So what happens here is that the water, which remember is a substrate of photosynthesis, absorbs light and is split into oxygen, hydrogen ions, and electrons. Now remember, hydrogen ions have another name, which is that they are also known as protons. And the final product is electrons. And overall, this process is known as photolysis, which makes sense really, because photo means relating to light, and lysis means splitting apart. And so if you have a look again, water is being split using light and it is split into oxygen, hydrogen ions and electrons. 
let's write a summary equation for that. And we can see here that oxygen is a byproduct, and that explains why oxygen appears on the right hand side of the photosynthesis equation. Now we're going to get slightly more complex by looking at the products of photolysis and first of all we're going to look at these electrons over here. Now the electrons released by the photolysis of water enter photosystem 2 which is present in the thylakoid membrane and we're going to write that here. Electrons enter photosystem 2 which is in the thylakoid membrane and at this point I'm sure you're wondering what is photosystem 2? And so it makes sense, first of all, to state that a photosystem is a group of pigments located in the thylakoid membrane. The most important of those pigments is chlorophyll A. And chlorophyll, I'm sure you've heard of before, is a very important pigment involved in photosynthesis. And the last thing to point out generically when we're talking about photosystems is that there are two photosystems, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. And the one that we're first interested in at the beginning part of the light dependent stage of photosynthesis is photosystem 2. So going back to these electrons which have been released by the photolysis of water, the electrons from those water molecules enter photosystem 2 first. Confusing I know, but the photosystems were named in the order that they were discovered, not the order that they're used. The chlorophyll in photosystem 2 absorb light and when they absorb light, the electrons gain energy or become excited. The absorption of this light causes a process called photoionization of chlorophyll, which releases the excited electrons into a series of proteins called the electron transfer chain. So the excited electrons are released into a series of proteins called the electron transfer chain. And as you'd expect, the electrons pass along the electron transfer chain, losing energy all the time, which is actually transferred to the proteins of the electron transfer chain. So if we have a look at what's taking place in this diagram, remember that we're still looking at the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So here we can see that light has caused the photolysis of water, releasing oxygen and hydrogen ions, as well as electrons. As I've already discussed, that electrons enter photosystem 2, and then the absorption of light causes photoionization of the chlorophyll found at photosystem 2, meaning that those excited electrons get released into a series of proteins that we can see here in pink, and they release energy as they are passed along this electron transfer or electron transport chain. Now these proteins use that energy to pump hydrogen ions, protons, which remember were produced by the photolysis of water up here, and those proteins pump those protons from the stroma into the thylakoid space or thylakoid lumen. So let's make the next point. Proteins use this energy to pump the protons or the hydrogen ions produced by the photolysis of water from the stroma into the thylakoid lumen or space. And as you'd expect, this therefore leads to a buildup of protons inside the thylakoid space and effectively you've set up a concentration gradient. And just to reiterate, we can see those hydrogen ions being pumped from the stroma through those protein channels into the thylakoid space, the thylakoid lumen, so we're getting a large buildup of protons, hydrogen ions within the thylakoid space. And because we have that concentration gradient, naturally they'll want to move back into the stroma, and they're going to do that using an enzyme, which we can see over here, called ATP synthase. So hydrogen ions pass back across the membrane through an enzyme called ATP synthase. And as those hydrogen ions pass through the ATP synthase, they provide the energy required for the ATP synthase to produce ATP from ADP and an inorganic phosphate. 
And as you can see, the hydrogen ions are passing through here, nice and passively, because they're going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that enables that ATP synthase to combine the ADP plus that inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. And this flow of hydrogen ions through the ATP synthase is known as chemiosmosis. Why is it called chemiosmosis? Well, osmosis, because it's going from an area of high concentration here, lots of protons, to an area of low concentration here, few protons. And rather than it being related to water, it's related to protons. So that's why it's chemiosmosis. And finally, why is it chemiosmosis rather than chemidiffusion? Because it's a partially permeable membrane. Here's our double membrane made up of lots of phospholipids. It's partially permeable because it's only permeable at the ATP synthase. So the next stage of our story, of our photosynthesis journey, is to describe what's happening to that electron, which got spat out by the first electron transfer chain. It now enters photosystem one. So electrons from the electron transfer chain now enter photosystem one. Again, light excites the electrons and in photosystem one causes the photoionization of the chlorophyll in there. The released electrons enter another electron transfer chain, which again use the energy to pump protons into the thylakoid space. So we're very repetitive. The major difference this time, however, is that once the electrons reach the end of the electron transfer chain, they are accepted by a coenzyme called NADP+. Now that NADP plus combines with those electrons that we've just mentioned, plus the protons that flowed through the ATP synthase to form reduced NADP, otherwise known as NADPH. And so to reiterate, we know that electrons pass through that second electron transfer chain. We know that hydrogen ions have been pumped by the ATP synthase. Both of these things now get accepted by NADP+. Because that NADP+, gains hydrogen ions, we can say that the NADP+, has been reduced. Because remember, reduction is a scientific word of which one of its meanings is the gain of hydrogen. And so as we look, we can see that that NADPH has definitely gained hydrogen and you can either write it with the H afterwards or just say that it's been reduced because we know it's been reduced because it's gained hydrogen. And this is the end of the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. We've used up water during photolysis, we've produced oxygen as a byproduct and most importantly we've produced ATP and NADPH which are vital for the light independent stage which we're going to move on to now. We're now ready to turn our attention to the light independent stage of photosynthesis, which you probably called the Calvin cycle. Now the light independent stage of photosynthesis relies upon the products of the light dependent stage, which remember were ATP and reduced NADP. And they were produced in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. And so what I'm really trying to point out here is that although light isn't directly involved in the light independent stage, without it, the necessary NADPH and ATP would not be available to the plant. Now, the light independent stage, the Calvin cycle, takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. Whereas remember before we were constantly talking about the thylakoid membrane and the thylakoid space, we're now talking about the stroma. The overall purpose of this stage is to produce carbohydrates that can be incorporated into glucose or other organic molecules and it does this through a series of biochemical steps. So our purpose of the light independent stage is to make glucose. So let's get into the nitty gritty of the Calvin cycle, the light independent stage of photosynthesis. Now the first step is the fixation of a molecule of carbon dioxide. And remember that carbon dioxide is one of the reactants on the left hand side of the photosynthesis equation. Carbon dioxide is fixed to ribulose bisphosphate. 
which you may have seen written as RUBP. Notice that this process may also be known as decarboxylation, it means the same thing as the carbon dioxide fixation. Crucially, this is carried out by an enzyme called Rubisco. Just notice for me that ribulose bisphosphate is a five carbon compound. It's so important that you know how many carbons are in all of these molecules. Now the fixation of carbon dioxide to ribulose bisphosphate forms an unstable six carbon compound. And because it's unstable, it immediately splits into two three carbon molecules of glycerate three phosphate. So two molecules of glycerate three phosphate are formed. It would make sense therefore that these molecules are made up of three carbon atoms because after all, a single six carbon compound has split to produce two three carbon compounds. You can call glycerate three phosphate GP. Glycerate three phosphate is then reduced to triose phosphate, which is another three carbon compound. So GP, glycerate three phosphate, is reduced to triose phosphate. As the name suggests, triose, it is a three carbon compound. And this process requires both ATP and reduced NADP. And remember that both of these substances were made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. Let's just reiterate again. So we know carbon dioxide is fixed by the enzyme Rubisco, an unstable six carbon compound is produced as a result, which immediately splits to form two molecules of glycerate three phosphate. And then due to the presence of ATP and reduced NADP, that GP is reduced to form triose phosphate, a three carbon compound. If we look at the role of ATP and that reduced NADP at this point, ATP provided the energy needed to convert GP to triose phosphate, whereas that reduced NADP provided the hydrogen needed to reduce the G3P into TP. We know that we've produced triose phosphate. What's going to happen now? Well, some of these triose phosphates are used to form hexo sugars, the most famous of which is glucose and other organic molecules. So this is actually the useful part of photosynthesis taking place finally. The rest are used to regenerate that initial ribulose bisphosphate ready for another turn of the Calvin cycle because after all it is a cycle, it just keeps going round and round. So the rest of the triose phosphate are used to regenerate RUBP. And so if you look at our overall equation for photosynthesis again, you can see that that water was broken down in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis by the process of photolysis. Um, I said that one of those byproducts was oxygen. The carbon dioxide was used in the light independent stage, the Calvin cycle, and the product at this point was glucose. So we've been through step by step the Calvin cycle, but now I want to show you a diagram which shows the Calvin cycle pictorially, and that should help you understand it just a little bit more. So remember, we're talking about the light independent stage of photosynthesis, and that takes place in the stroma of the chloroplast. To bear in mind, remember that we have that NADPH and the ATP, which was made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So at some point they're going to be needed in the Calvin cycle. Because it's a cycle, you can start anywhere, but I'm choosing to start with ribulose bisphosphate, which is over here. Remember, it's a five carbon compound. And what happens is that the enzyme Rubisco fixes carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to the RUBP, forming a six carbon unstable intermediate, which you do not need to know the name of that six carbon unstable intermediate immediately splits into the three carbon glycerate three phosphate, G3P, and then that G3P is reduced to triose phosphate, which is another three carbon compound, and that requires both ATP, you can see that going in here, and that NADPH, which came from the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. So despite the fact that the Calvin cycle does not require light in order to take place, Remember, it does require these two substances and they could only be made in the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. The ATP has provided energy and the NADPH has provided the hydrogen required to reduce that G3P to triose phosphate. Now, some of that triose phosphate is used to make glucose primarily or lipids or amino acids. The rest of it is used to regenerate RUBP.
and so we're ready for another turn of the Calvin cycle. Now I want to show you some past exam questions so you can have a real idea as to how you're going to be tested on this. So now we're looking at some past paper questions. So which process occurs during the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis? Remember that that occurs in the thylakoid and that we're making NADPH and ATP, which will then feed into the Calvin cycle. The other thing to remember is that oxygen is produced as a byproduct. So it's not a useful product, but it is a byproduct. So let's have a look at the options. So which processes occur during the light-dependent reaction of photosynthesis? ATP, carbon dioxide and water are produced? No, because carbon dioxide and water are our substrates for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is used to produce carbohydrates? No, production of carbohydrates occurs in the Calvin cycle, which is not this stage of photosynthesis. ATP and oxygen are produced? Yes, that's true. RUBP is phosphorylated? No, that again occurs in the Calvin cycle, so you do need in-depth knowledge here. Describe the process of photolysis and photosynthesis. This is worth three marks, by the way. So remember that photo meaning light, lysis means splitting, and now remember what that light is splitting. Well, it's a water molecule, so water is split by light. And then remember what it's split into, into oxygen, hydrogen ions, otherwise known as protons, and electrons. It's good to point out, because it's worth three marks, that those electrons then enter photosystem two. What is used to reduce NADP in the light-dependent reactions of photosynthesis? I hope you gathered from my description earlier that remember those electrons pass along that electron transport chain once they've been spat out of photosystem one, and then they get accepted by that NADP plus. So let's see which of those answers matches up. Conversion of ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate, no. Electrons from photosystem one, yes, I just said that. Protons from the thylakoid space, no. Oxygen released by the photolysis of water, no, that's irrelevant. So the answer here is B. What process occurs during the light independent reactions of photosynthesis? Remember, this is the Calvin cycle where we use the enzyme Babisco. We know RUBP is involved. We're trying to produce glucose and amino acids. So oxygen is released into the atmosphere. No, that occurred in the light-dependent stage of photosynthesis. Protons are pumped from the thylakoid space into the stroma. No, again, the light-dependent stage of photosynthesis. RUBP is carboxylated and then regenerated in the carbon cycle. Yes, for sure. Look, I've mentioned those words here. Triosphosphate is converted to glycerate 3-phosphate. No, it occurs the other way round. Although those molecules are mentioned, in the light independent reactions of photosynthesis, they've definitely got it the wrong way around, which is why C is the answer. Okay, now this last question I'm going to do quite strangely because I'm just going to talk you through the mark scheme effectively because it is worth eight marks and I do just want to make sure that you understand the mark scheme at this point. So explain chemiosmosis as it occurs in photophosphorylation. Remember, chemiosmosis is all to do with that ATP synthase. We know that hydrogen ions are flowing passively through the ATP synthase, causing that ADP to combine with that inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. So in terms of having a look at the mark scheme, there's a mark for saying that photophosphorylation literally means that it's the production of ATP. Looking at the mark scheme, they really do just want an explanation of the light-dependent stage of photosynthesis, which is why they start by mentioning that light is absorbed by photosystem 2, that light causes the photolysis of water, which I've already mentioned higher up, means that that water molecule splits into hydrogen ions, electrons and oxygen. The electron moves through the electron transport chain. We know that the electrons release energy as they pass through that electron transport chain, meaning that those protons are pumped into the thylakoid space, allowing that concentration gradient to build up. And then, really zooming in now on that chemiosmosis part of the question, we know that hydrogen ions move by diffusion through that ATP synthase, the ADP combines with the inorganic phosphate to produce ATP. That's what causes the generation of the ATP. It's quite an interesting question because it's actually dressed up to look quite difficult. But actually, for me, the question really is explain the light dependent stage of photosynthesis. And so doing well in IB is all about recognising what the question is actually asking.